Welcome everyone. My name is Mikey Mhenna. It is my honor to introduce our special guest. Rania Matar is a Guggenheim 2018 fellow. She was born and raised in Lebanon and moved to the U.S. in 1984. As a Lebanese-born American woman and mother, Rania's cultural background, cross-cultural experience, and personal narrative inform her photography. She has dedicated her work to exploring issues of, per of personal collective identity through photographs of female adolescence and womanhood. She works both in the US where she lives and in the Middle East where she is from in an effort to focus on notions of identity and individuality, all within the context of underlying universality of these experiences. Vanya's work has been widely published and exhibited in museums around the world, including the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, the Carnegie Museum of Art, National Museum of Women in the Arts, and more. A mid-career retrospective of her work was recently on view at the Cleveland Museum of Art and at the Amon Carter Museum of American Art in a solo exhibition, In Her Image, photographs by Rania Matar. Rania, it is a huge honor to have you on the series. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Miki. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everybody who joined. I'm honored to be here. Well, uh, Rania, let me ask you a question. Um, your work is deeply, deeply intimate and emotional. Um, but the last couple of times we've spoken, you're this like effusive, sunny personality. Um, are you, do you feel different inside than you do outside? Because outside you're like this smiley, fun, uh, friendly, friendly person, but your work feels really, really heavy. Is there like a, a heaviness inside and a lightness outside or do no, you look no. at your work and you don't think of it as necessarily being very heavy? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't think it's heavy. I think it's real and I want it to be real and intimate. When I'm working with people, um, I'm trying to stay away from the Christmas pictures of you know the holiday cards where everybody's just smiling for the camera. I'm collaborating intimately with people. And when you collaborate int intimately, you're getting to something that feels personal and intimate and uh so I hope it's not heavy but um and I hope there's a duality in some way in the work uh I come from a like many of you here like you definitely Mickey from like a complicated background I mean in addition to being born and raised in Lebanon I'm from Palestinian parents and and now I live in the U.S. and I carry all this background baggage and I became a photographer because of that. I was trained as an architect. So for me, it's a matter of telling that story. Um, my aim, I guess, in my work, and a lot of it is shattering that the stereotypes that people in the US have in the Middle East. I became a photographer after September 11. Um, so I don't think it's heavy. Maybe it's complex. I think the Middle East is complicated. I, it's yeah. all about women and about growing up. And I think growing up is complicated. Right. So, yeah, I want to talk Sorry, about. That. I want to go back to the sunny personality and whatever. Yeah. I think. <laughs> I Good. Think I struck a nerve. No, 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 no. Because I think it helps me get connect with people that I'm photographing. I mean, mm -hmm. if you don't have that warm personality to make people comfortable, you don't get the intimacy that people give you, right? So I yeah. think it's a matter of making the process fun and collaborative and being able to make people trust you and um, and give you all they can, right? Absolutely. So I wanted, you sort of touched on something I wanted to talk about, um, which, is this, which is the fact that you started your career as an architect and you studied architecture and this was the sort of the first part of your career. Um, and I'm curious about if you feel like that, um, your training as an architecture, as an architect, as well as your uh, delayed entry into the world of photography, uh, influenced your art in a way that you can sort of put your finger on where you're like, yeah, I, have, I, take, I take photographs like this, or my perspective is like this, I can trace it back to the fact that I w I'm an architect, or I can trace it back to the fact that I didn't study photography at the age of 18. You know, I think we're all like, everything we absorb through our life make us who we are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am trained as an architect, but I did a lot of art in college. Ironically, not photography, but I did uh, etching, printing, painting, and, uh, and uh, charcoal drawing. And um, 
So I have that visual training. My thesis in architecture was about building a, a museum for the late work of Picasso, um, wow. uh, of his wife, Jacqueline, who had died a couple of years earlier. So it's the, the relation between architecture and art was kind of always there for me. Maybe somehow I went to the other side now where the architecture are present in the art versus the art being present in the architecture. Uh, but it's very much part of who I am, how I see things. The images are pretty structured. I'm very careful about the lines parallel to the frames. I'm always, I'm, I mainly work with people, but they're not just portraits. I think the space is always important. So that's yeah. very, much part of my architectural training. Uh, and I work in a structured way, like an architect. I'm not very structured in any other aspect in my life, especially except for the way I work. So I kind of work yeah. by project and I get myself immersed in that. And that feels like part of the training I've had in architecture school. Yeah, so I wanna go to this. I mean, that comes across to me. And I think the first thing I said to you when we got on the call was, I. Your, your work is so beautifully intimate, deeply intimate. Um, and I feel like somehow you, you sort of take the viewer into these, these worlds, these scenes, these rooms. Um, and I was reading an, an interview that you, that you had where you said, quote, you should get the, the same level of intimacy with everybody you photograph as, you, uh, as with the photos of your children. Um, does yeah. that sometimes sometimes quotes are mis, uh, misattributed and even if they're not misattributed sometimes you read them again and you're like eh, I don't really feel that way is is that how you feel you know I feel that but that was a quote that somebody told me okay so and, tell, yeah, uh, tell me more but it, so it resonated with me not everybody has children and I teach classes to people of all ages but what should resonate from that quote is to make, uh, and a lot of the work I've been teaching, ex especially since COVID was like, go photograph in your home or in your backyard, because this is where if you learn to photograph intimately with the people you're comfortable with, it's ultimately this becomes second nature for you. Somebody told me that when I went to my first, what you call portfolio reviews, and I had just started photographing in Palestinian refugee camps, and I was uncomfortable, I felt like, a like a voyeuristic, I was walking in there. So I was afraid to getting close to people. And the person who looked at my work saw the pictures of my children and then the picture, the early photos I made in the camps. And they said, you need to have that same intimacy with everybody you photograph. And that was the best advice anyone ever gave me. And it stuck a nerve and it stayed there. And I learned to not just walk on the street and make pictures, but to ultimately meet and really see the people and be with them. So I work with a wide angle lens, I'm there. I'm not, I'm not far and trying to steal a moment. I'm right there in this space. And that for me, I learned by photographing my kids. This was my, my earliest work, as we were asking me how I got into photography, my early work in photography was photographing my children. I started taking workshops and I had, to, I had homework every week and they were my little subject. I had four kids. Mm -hmm. I'm home with them. I'm in the US, not in Lebanon, so not much help. And it turned into a beautiful collaborative um, project. And I love this work. And I'm glad you're showing it because it doesn't, not many, I mean, it's special to me. I haven't done much with it otherwise. You just said something really interesting. And because I'm not a photographer, I don't know what this feels like. And so I wanna ask you about it. You, it okay, so how do, how do I ask this properly? Um, you're taking deeply intimate photos and you're, you're using wide angle lenses. You're not trying to be removed on some sort of telephoto lens. Um, do you, do you want to be seen? Do you want to be felt in the room by your subjects or do you want to be this fly on the wall or, or do you, are you in, in sort of, uh, interface with them, engagement with them? No, no, no I'm here with you. It's very interesting you ask that because it depends yeah. a little bit. Like my earlier work, that work you're just showing here, where uh, was the black and white early work I did, I kind of wanted to almost be a fly on the wall. And even though I still work in the same way, but when I got into photographing 
young woman and it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with me in her room originally for a girl in her room i couldn't just be a fly on the wall she's aware of my presence and but how do i make her comfortable so she almost forgets that I'm there, even though she knows I'm there. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I want to get her to that point where she's comfortable. So it's kind of a little bit of a, it's a choreography on my end where I have to gently control the situation, but also let it happen on its own and observe it. And often it's a matter of, you know, I put the camera down when I'm, when I'm, sh when I'd be shooting, but then I put the camera down, and I start talking to the women. And when I'm talking to them, like some would go like that, or the shoulders would fall, or they get mm -hmm. comfortable. And I could say, oh, can you hold this? And I pick up the camera again. So I am still an observer, but I am also very present in the room, right? Yeah. So it's kind of a very interesting um, line to juggle a little bit. Yeah, because it there's almost this like, there's this, uh, implied respect that comes from acknowledging your your presence there because obviously you're there obviously right yeah um and so if it's and it goes back to your that sunny disposition right that sort of warm and non-judgmental uh uh sort of energy and presence that you're giving was like listen i'm here and i know that you see me but yeah. <laughs> let me be here with you i want you to see me here with you right mm -hmm. almost observing you um, so I want to, I want to ask you about this, another quote that you talked about, um, in the post 9-11 environment. I, I know that a lot, a lot of younger Arab and Arab Americans don't remember what post 9-11 really felt like. Um, and this sort of, you know, the, the war chant of, of Bush's America, the enormous anti, uh, the enormous amount of Islamophobia and sort of anti-Arab spirit. Um, describe what that was like for you specifically, and how that carried over into some of the work that you were um, preparing you at know, the time. First, is I'm lucky to be living in in Boston. I'm on the East Coast in a very kind of. Uh, um, non-judgmental, pretty open city. So I never heard anything personally myself, but the news, we were bombarded with that anti-Arab, anti-everything news, and it kind of an ignorance. And even though I left Lebanon because of the war, um, I never felt, uh, I mean, th there was this kind of just ten putting everybody in a one dimension that almost everybody is a terrorist. And that was unbearable to hear. I mean, the people I knew there, as you know, are warm and kind and loving. They would, I mean, I would go to a Palestinian refugee camp to make pictures uh, and they have nothing and they would offer, go send, send their kid to get me, to buy me a Coke or whatever. And there was so much dignity. And, and for me, it was, this was what made me a photographer besides photographing my children. I wanted at that point to tell a different story from there. It was, and I felt like this whole rhetoric of them versus us really hit a chord with me up to that point. I mean, I have to tell you, I was working as an architect, raising my four children and I was in my bubble. We bought a house. I had become an American citizen. I wasn't thinking about Am I Arab? Am I Lebanese? Am I Palestinian? Am I American? I was me, right? And uh, and automatically, it's like you can't help but start identifying and thinking of like, what is my identity? And it became important for me to to reconcile the two identity. I mean, I am them, I am us, and I am me, right? So, um, I think that was a change in my whole path where this is I became a photographer and stayed a photographer yeah and this became consistent in all my work even though now I'm not necessarily photographing only in Lebanon I'm photographing in both but for me it's very much about focusing on that shared humanity and I do it mainly through womanhood and through growing up and motherhood and yeah so uh, before we move on to some of the, your other books so you have four books um that including the most recent that has just come out, uh, a girl. So in order, um, you started in 2009 uh, with Ordinary Lives. And I'd love to sort of think about, and then the rest of them sort of focus on women and womanhood. Um, I'm curious how Ordinary Lives was received 
um, both in the Arab world and in, um, and in the US? Um, it was received very well in the US because I live here and it kind of put me on the map, actually. It put me on the map in Boston and, and in the US. I was just making my work and, uh, and I was showing it once to a curator. It's like, oh my God, you should be showing this work. And she kind of advised me about how to start putting the work out there. Um, it was interesting work for me because it made me as well learn so much about different areas and different different areas of Lebanon. I mean, I grew up in a relatively sheltered household um, and I had never been, you know, growing up in a civil war, my circle was tiny, right? Um, I did not know all the complexities of Lebanon. So I, I, I it, this work ended up including uh, the Palestinian refugee camp. And then, and then again, as a reaction to all the Bush rhetoric, uh, all of a sudden you saw a huge uh, shift in Lebanon where many young women started wearing the hijab, the veil, which didn't exist in Beirut when I was there, right? So I became interested in all the meaning, meanings of it because again, uh, in the West, do you think of every old, I mean, people often think of women as, um, in the Arab world as oppressed and, uh, I don't know what word to use. And for me, there was so many, again, it's not a one dimensional thing. There are so many different grades. And I became interested in that because I was learning as I'm photographing it, that there was an element of fashion. There was also resistance. There was also, um, you know, of course, modesty and devotion. So it was interesting for me to come to terms with that. And then 2006, I got stuck in the war and I decided to go between Israel, Israel and Hezbollah. And I decided to go back and photograph the aftermath because I wanted to get my kids out of the country and I'm not a war photographer. So that was important to me. So all this work, and then I realized, oh my God, I'm not even including a big part of the population. That's a very devout Christian community in Lebanon, uh, which I wasn't as interested in learning about because I am originally Christian, right? So, um, but it became important to get to include that. So for me, this is work that if I was to redo the book, I probably would edit it differently now uh, because I have evolved in different ways, but it was important work for me. In what way, I'm curious, in what way do you feel like you would have edited it differently? And, and also, can you tell us about the editing process? For, for those of us who've never put together a book, um, what, what is, is that process like? Book, I think you learned, I learned so much with every book. Um, that was my first book. I, and it's hard sometimes to step away from your pictures um, and to look at them with fresh eyes. And there are images in there that I should, I mean, it was important to me at that time to have it as it is, but I might put a little bit less and a tighter edit of stronger images. Let's put it this way. Um, but that being said, this is always the case with a book and it's important to have the publisher or like if you edit with a book for a book, you could include, I don't know, 60 to 80 images. More than that feels like too much. If you edit for an exhibition, you could put maybe 20 to 50, depending on the size of the show. So yeah. there's a, there are all different layers of how you edit. And it's hard. I could help my students or friends edit so easily, and it's very hard to do it for my own yeah. work and myself. What is uh, the process of editing? What is the process of the decision to make an exhibition, a book, or a book and exhibition? What's the order? Like, do you start a project thinking... Yeah, what's the sort of inception point? Do you do you have an idea? Then you go out for no, funding. No, I started a project. I typically follow my own instinct, and I realize, oh, I have a project. And in all of those was the case. I kind of follow something that I'm doing, and if I feel like, oh, it's turning into a body of work, let's put it this way. And I keep accumulating in it. I can, as long as I feel invigorated and inspired with this work, I feel like I'm so in it and it's so important to me and I'm running with it. And, and I don't really think at that point, there's a level of editing that happens from a shoot. Like I would photograph a lot during a session and I'm, I have to pick the best of that one. And then there's a layer of accumulating work over 
month or years and then what is the best of that so it's important to start i start making prints and i lay them all over the floor in my studio and i live with them and i start moving them around to see and then some of them feel like sometimes it's hard because i love two images so much but they're not saying anything different so i have to pick the one that might work better with the sequence and uh, and sequencing is important. Yeah. In an exhibition, you often have another person involved, the person offering you the space, whether it's a gallery or a museum. And I tend to welcome that, um, that dialogue and collaboration that happens with with that process and then in the editing like the last book i did i worked with an incredible designer and it was so nice to have this back and forth with the editing like he sent me i sent him an original sequence he fiddled around with it and he told me actually send me your selection a selection b selection c so I put 80 in A and maybe five in B and five in C. And he says, no, the A should be the ones that you would kill me if they're not in the book. So it was so good to, to have somebody jump in a little bit and help me with that. So I'm gonna read a little bit of, uh, about the introduction, uh, about the description of this uh, project, She, which just came out. Um, and it's a, you say, I'm focusing in this project on young women in their twenties, the ages of my own daughters. Um, have you always, has, have the ages and sort of places of your subjects always mirrored um, the places of your own family? Are you sort of looking for different mirror images of who they are and who they might be sort of reflecting off different places? Yes, my, my I mean, and if you're, I mean, all the work is very autobiographical. The early work, even in the, in the refugee camps and all this, it was a matter of, was the first time I kind of was facing the idea that I'm originally Palestinian and I wanted to go to the camp and photograph, to the camps and photograph. And this was at that point, just to jump backward, um, it was very organic that I found myself focusing on women. I didn't plan on doing that. And, uh, but there was something that was binding me so tightly to those women as mothers. So it was personal on some level that the fact that whatever I was photographing in southern Lebanon and in the camps even in areas I had never known there was this motherhood and womanhood aspect that for me felt that was more important um that was we, we were more similar than different right uh and then I all the other work I became I was fascinated with my daughters growing up and I felt like I would start uh mirroring what's happening at home by wanting to um photograph women the same ages my daughters don't let me photograph them as much anymore but i feel like with every woman i'm photographing or young woman i'm photographing in some way there's part of my daughter in that and like when my daughter left for college i started photographing i made a whole project on mothers and daughters and to do add to that do they sorry, do they like this stuff yeah, they do. They're very involved in it and they give me their opinions and they find me people to photograph. Um, I managed to get them in some of the work, but um, even my sons helped me find people to photograph. I mean, so it's kind of uh, another thing to add, though, I we're getting personal. I lost my mother at the age of three. So I grew up without a mother. My I was a tomboy and my 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 hero was my father, really, my um so for me, learning that whole sense about femininity and womanhood probably also comes from a place of me discovering myself. I mean, um, something that's probably buried in there. My relationship to my daughters is something I'm learning firsthand because I, again, I lost my mom very young and I don't have that. Yeah, it's, I mean, as you say that, this is why I asked you the question about, do you want to be seen also in the photos? Because th your perspective is really prominent. Um, and the fact that you use these wide angle lenses almost gives the viewer a trace of where you are, right? And where you're standing and the fact that, oh, this is a space that we're both in. It's almost like the she that you're talking about is the mother gazing at her daughter in these images, not the daughter gazing back at the mother, right? It's absolutely true. And at the same time, I never, I, I make sure that I'm, for me, it's the mother gazing at the daughters. And you said it perfectly because 
I don't want them to feel like it's a mother in the room because it would change the whole dynamic. Uh, so I don't want to be associated with the mother. I want to be associated with them and them associate with me as their photographer or whatever it is. As soon as, if I'm associated with them as their mother, the whole dynamic shifts, right? But I'm looking at them as all of them as my daughters and I'm very protective of all of them and how the work ends up. And if you talk to any of them, I'm always saying, are you sure you're okay? Uh, are you cold or whatever? So I'm, I kind of tend to have that. And I, I'm very careful when the pictures end up being shown as well. Yeah. Um, do you feel like as, you know, you sort of, your work oscillates between being about the Arab world and a, being about sort of the US and being about having sort of global or universality. Do you also go through those things where you, you feel like, okay, I want to zoom out a little bit and I want to think about women everywhere. Sometimes I want to zoom in and, and, and sort of discuss or feel or explore what, what sort of women in Lebanon look like and feel like. Do you also personally go through these ups and downs? You know, um... It's more my sense of identity. And actually, sorry, just because you're yeah. here, I want to point that this is the perfect time to ask this question. Like the cover of the book, this is the jacket, by the way, that you have here. This is the jacket of the book. Like I have the book here. This is yeah. the cover. And if you open it, we couldn't decide on what, we wanted all the women to be in it. So the book opens. And what you're showing there is the jacket, right? Yeah, amazing. So I love that you put that picture here because that in a bit answered the questions for you, but also the cover picture is almost like an auto portrait for me of her. I left Lebanon when I was her age and she's, she looks like she's looking one way and her body's turned the other way. And there's this fact of almost being between two places, right? Um, I got the chills saying that. That's very much me at her age and that's still me right now. Can you go back to the next photo? Yeah. So when we did the cover, the, it's all in the details, but if you notice that her image turns, when you turn the spine, which is what you're seeing here, I don't know if you could point with your yeah. mouth on it. Um, if you turn, no, go back to the yeah. next one. Yeah, if, exactly. The Mediterranean is turning into the Atlantic. Do you see oh, that, nice. the horizon yeah, right line? So the work is very personal to me. It's personal because it's my like my daughter's, but it's also in a way that was such a potent work for me. Um, you know, it's the time I left Lebanon. It's these women are in such a, at such a cross point in their lives as young adults. Uh, my mother died when she was 28. Um, when I was a kid, I thought she was old till I realized she was the age of those women. So this is the first book I actually dedicate to my mother as well. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. The completely. <laughs> no, it absolutely does. Um, I want to jump into some of the other books. One of them that I really, really loved, or one of the other works is A Girl in Her Room. Mm -hmm. um, because it's... Um, it's almost, in some ways, it's it's so different than she. I mean, those the the portraits and she that uh, are in that cover, um, or in the 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 flap, um, the jacket, it, are so expansive, right? They're huge. They feel like you see horizons, and they're almost otherworldly, right? They're beautiful, right? Um, and then and then you see the intimacy of these little corners, these nooks and crannies, and I love nooks and crannies personally. I mean, uh, whenever I go, whenever I go to my mom's house, she always makes fun of me because I go to the smallest area of the kitchen every single time, and I just sit there. She's like, Tub. "I get too." <laughs> I love, I love little corners. Um, how did this project come up? I love this project, by the way. I just well, I this, it. you know. Um... This was, it's, you know, after The Ordinary Life was done and the book was out, I felt like I was so done with this work and I wanted to photograph in the US because I live here, my daughters are growing up here. My daughter at that point was 15 and she was, she had, she has a twin brother. So she was a complete tomboy. And all of a sudden I felt like I hardly knew her. She was changing and I became fascinated with her. And, uh, so I started photographing her with her friends would come over and I realized how much they were each even performing even more to each other because they all kind of 
had to sound the same and look the same. So I started photographing each young woman by herself. And after a couple of them picked the bedroom, I realized, oh my God, that's my project. Because this is very much the one place those women felt like they could deal with their search for identity, what they put on the wall, what they, um, you know, what they're living in their lives. And I felt like it was, I, I realized, oh my God, that's my project. And of course, I remembered myself in their room at, at that age, when you shut the door, nobody could go in. And this is your own cocoon where the world outside is so complicated, right? So this work started in the US. And, um, and at some point I realized, oh my God, I was exactly like those women, a different culture, different place, different time. And that there was such a universality to the growing up. So the work in a way, without being just about the Middle East, like my earlier work here, I felt became about this universality of the shared humanity again, through womanhood, through that age of where, even though their lives could be different, um, but they're all going through that change at the same time, right? So because you compare it to she, she for me is an, they're older and they left home. So on some level, they're out of that domestic space. The, the world is now more complicated for them because they're thrown out in the wild, right? So this is kind of makes sense on some level where um, that's the change, I guess. Yeah. But this was, it, in a way, it was a bit similar in the sense that there was this collaboration happening with the women and they completely got the project. Yeah. Um, how many of the photos, uh, I wonder what this, this project would have looked like had you, um, if you did A Girl in Her Room part two in Beirut or in, in Lebanon or in the Arab world, if you feel that, if how it would look, is there a universality to these images that you think is, oh yeah, this may as well be in Lebanon? Or do you think it would look really, really different? Um, you mean photographing the same women now? No, they... no, no. Because no, a lot no. of them are in Lebanon. These, a lot oh, of these... a lot of these are in Lebanon, sorry. Yeah, thought... the women here, like actually go back one. Can yeah. you go a couple back? This is in Lebanon. Oh, the cover okay. was in Lebanon. And, and actually, you know what, to speak about the cover, this was included in an exhibition called She Who Tells the Story, Women Photographers from Iran and the Arab World. And people would come to the curator and tell her, we thought you're only showing Arab women. And she said, I am only showing Arab women. And they get into an argument with her. And I love that because this, again, is shattering the whole stereotypes about what people in this country often think what the Arab women looks like, you know? Yeah. Um, can you go back one more? Sorry. Akeem. So the bottom one is actually in uh, Jerusalem. It was the first time, either Jerusalem or Bethlehem, I can't remember offhand, it's on, the, but was my one and only visit to the to Palestine, really. Yeah. Um, so I want to include that. If you go further, um, if you go a couple more, the, to, the woman here laying down is, uh, is the woman in Lebanon as well. And she actually got very hurt uh, in the explosions of August yeah. 4 last year. And there was a picture of her that went viral all over Instagram, laying down 10, 10 years to the day from when we took that picture, almost in the same way covered with blood. So a lot of these women are Lebanese. I'm so glad that you corrected me because I thought at first oh, when you yeah, said no, no, I a lot of them. And see, I love that, that you don't know, Lebanese and Palestinians as well. Yeah. I mean. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit um, about uh, a few things. Yeah. The first is, the first sentence I read in your bio is, Rania Matar is a 2018 Guggenheim Fellow. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? And how did that change your career? Well, that is a big... Um, it's, it's, it was a huge honor for me, and I didn't want it to get lost in the bio, and like because with everything else, yeah, uh, I, I don't know how much people uh, outside the U.S. would know what it is, but it's kind of a huge honor to receive a Guggenheim Fellow here. It's a big grant that they give you uh, a year, basically, to do. You have to submit for it and have references, and it's hard. It's hard. It's pretty selective. So to get a Guggenheim Fellowship is a huge step of approval. I mean, it gave me so much confidence to, to run and make work. And I was lucky to receive it at about at the same time that my youngest son 
was going to college. So all of a sudden I had this Guggenheim with no kids at home. So I was able to travel more widely within the US and I wanted to travel even more within the Middle East, but we know what the situation is. So I just went to Cairo and more often to Lebanon. And, uh, but it, it's mainly a huge, I, I repeat it, but it's like a stamp of approval. It gave me, um, so much confidence to run away and make new work. It felt like, you know, I don't know how else to say it. You're, you're muted. That, that makes sense. Um, yeah, that makes sense. The, the question, I guess, is like functionally, aside from the confidence, and all of us need, and all of us need a, a push on the back and sort of a, a, a high five at times to feel like, okay, I guess we're doing something right and people want us to keep on going. But functionally, um, it's basically a big grant to say, yalla, keep on going, make this work. Is mm -hmm. that essentially? Well, they gave me a big grant. I didn't teach that year. I was okay. able to travel yeah. and to do all this. And uh, so, no, it was, it was, yeah, it was a big grant. It's a vote of confidence. It's, uh, and I don't know, yes, everybody needs it, but I think artists are, I don't know if, if everybody, but I am, yeah, we all have so much self-doubt that kind of could be daunting at some points that it's, it's it feels good to to get something where people are telling you go make this work you know yeah okay so speaking of artists having self-doubt and confidence i'm curious what advice you would give to uh 2001 aranya um who is considering going into this career um what advice would you uh travel back and give her now you know, interestingly, Mickey, I feel like I, like my husband in a different way asked me, what are your goals? And I feel like I don't overthink things like this. I kind of let things happen and I embrace them. Uh, I feel like I love that I kind of was just going on a, on a whim and didn't know much what I was doing. So I feel like if I was to give advice to anybody, I would say just follow your passion and make a work that means something to you and that makes you excited to go photograph or to make art, you know? So, uh, and I guess without quite knowing what I was doing, I was on that path in some way. If you ever told me I'd be showing a work to the museum and have four books, I would have said, oh my God, never, right? Yeah. So maybe it's good that I didn't know very much. There's something kind of, even if you know more, it's good to stay humble and then yeah. to kind of keep, um, wanting to reinvent yourself. So I think yeah. maybe it's better not to know what's next a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question. Yeah. Do you have a lot of photos of yourself in your from your childhood? You know, I, I had up to a point and then at some point a little bit less. And uh, why'd you ask? I'm curious because I, I'll tell you why I'm because I've been thinking a lot about this now. Because I'm I'm looking at these images and I I realize I for at first when I was interfacing with your work I I said oh these are these are reflections on who her daughter is and on on who her daughters may be, and then I thought about it, I'm looking at them now and I said no these are all self portraits. They probably are. I these mean, are all self portraits. This project, <laughs> this project of L'Enfant Femme, that was at that tipping point where, you know, the it's right before puberty when girls start, the bodies start changing and the attitude changes. But, you know, and when I was that age, it's, it, I was such a tomboy. I mean, I grew up just with a man, with my father. And, um, and I, at 11, my father at some point got remarried and I was kind of transformed. So this was a potent age for me as well. I mean, I guess you could see that through all the work. If, if we were to, you're good because you're making, making me analyze yeah. that. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at these and I'm like, okay, so this woman is watching her daughters grow up and is thinking to herself that what if I was right next to them? Yeah. Who would I be? Deb, let me go explore this <laughs> by reflecting maybe, myself maybe. Yeah. off all these uh, these people. Yeah, I, I, it, it's amazingly powerful. It's really beautiful. Um, okay, and that work just to talk about this for a bit. That was actually very interesting because this here, I'm not spent like with the girl in her room and with the she. The girls are older; they're women. I'm spending a long time with them. There's a collaboration going. It's a very organic relationship and. 
it evolves into that complete trust and all this. With these, it's very much about the gaze and how they are presenting themselves to the camera. And I'm shooting medium format film. And these girls don't even know what I'm talking about when I'm saying I'm shooting negative film. So they keep wanting to see the back of the camera and there's nothing to see. So I, I, I do not pose them at all. I'm only asking them not to give me the, the selfie smile and to look at the camera. And they take the shoot more seriously. So it's all in the details of the body language. And again, because we were speaking about the duality, I think here there's another sense of duality, which was between the little girl and having to present, how to think about how you present yourself as your body's starting to change, right? So yeah. it, they look simpler, I think, than they are. Amazing. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about your most recent project. Um, tell us a little bit about, I think it's called Loen, Loen Ruh. Yes, this is the first time I'm even talking about it. So excuse me if I don't know how I'm talking about it. Yeah, this, go for it. This started, you know, usually when I have a book that comes out, I feel like I'm done with the work, but I'm not done yet with that collaboration with these women. And But I found myself the last two years obsessing over Lebanon, especially the last year, I want to say. Um, just to back, sorry to make the answer long, the book kept getting delayed because of COVID. And because of that, there was a silver lining. I was able to add picture that were made after August 4th. So uh, after the explosions of August 4th. Now, if you go back, sorry, to the La Huelo. Yeah. So, um, when I went after August 4th, my son, by the way, left everything in the US and moved to Lebanon to volunteer at Offre Joie and still living there a year and a half later, a year and a couple of months later, falling in love with Lebanon. So I found this young generation of Lebanese super, and I, especially the women, so inspiring. It started with the Thaura and it's and then up to now where I'm seeing that they were the one cleaning the debris and whatever. So I thought I was gonna photograph the destruction and realize I'm not interested in the destruction. I'm interested in the beauty and the power, power of those women. So maybe here is my personality coming through even though they don't look happy, but I want them to be positive. Okay, so this work, um, and it kind of changed over the past year. I mean, there was a lot of hope, and I feel like after the summer, many of those women are leaving, and, and that broke my heart. And I saw this wall graffiti in Lebanon, at, uh, in Kfermata, and the silk factory, it said in Arabic, Lawen Ruh, and I'm like, oh my God. That's the title of the work. It's just like, boom, I'm zoomed on it. So this work is- For, those, like, for those listeners who don't speak Arabic, what does that mean? Where do I go? And I felt like it's a, it felt very powerful to me at that moment. I mean, there's between after the explosions and the dollar, uh, the, the Lebanese pound collapsing to the dollar and uh, hardly the, in the summer, there were lines for gas and no electricity. And I felt like, I was giving them so much credit because they were the strong one there and it broke my heart when some of them wanted to start finding a way to get out of Lebanon. And then they leave Lebanon and they're miserable. So I kind of, and so I don't know. So for me, this is the way of giving them their voice. So this work is even more collaborative and there's a performance element to it. Yeah. Uh, even the ones that leave are like me and they keep going back. And somehow Lebanon has this power over people where nobody really leaves ever, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know, I think. Yeah, yeah so, for sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, it's because there's a performance involved and they have ideas also. So I, this work couldn't be done without what they're giving me back as also. Amazing. Okay, Rania, we're going to do the quick Q&A, which is four okay. rapid fire questions. So the first question comes at you and it is, what are you reading or watching right now? Well, I had just finished a series of books that I loved about uh, my brilliant friend and uh, by, um, I'm spacing out on the name, help me please. It's uh, the Italian writer, um, oh, Elena Ferrante. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love it because it relates to my work on some way that it follows these girls and their friendship all through the years. And it's a series of four. And I just finished it. And now I'm reading a book called Object of Desire by, um, Object of Beauty of by, um, oh my God, I'm spacing out on his name. The actor, the actor with white hair who's very funny. Um, Steve Martin. 
Yes, he's an excellent writer. He's it's an about a young writer. woman navigating the art world, which is exactly again the story of my daughter. Yeah. So that's and I, I think he wrote Shop Girl as well. He's an excellent. Yes, writer. I haven't read Shop Girl. I'm reading the other one, and if you, I think it's Object of Beauty. It's excellent. He's a he's like a a polymath. He's really a absolutely man. like a Renaissance man, right? Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? You know, I saw that. I, I guess if I have to think, just because I came from Paris photo now and I saw so many pictures by Irvin Penn and I adore him, I would say maybe Irvin Penn, the okay. photographer, he could, Great. his work is fantastic on all levels. So I would say maybe him. Okay. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Okay, I don't know how quick that is. Um, um i don't know i think sometimes people wonder like why i'm only focusing on women and they think there's something that could be more uh voyeuristic about it and um i would say and it's mostly it's often guys who think that so we we misunderstand on behalf of (laughs) on behalf of my people we misunderstand a lot of things um the last question, um, and I'll adjust this slightly. Whose work do you admire or are inspired by? If you allow me, I'll adjust this to say outside of your profession. Because I'm sure there's an endless list of photographers who- Yes, am- absolutely. But sort of outside um, of your profession that maybe we'd be surprised by like, oh, I really love- You know what? Like I've always loved um, the work of Picasso. That sounds so cliche, but because I did my thesis on his latest work, I love yeah. that. But I've also loved the work of Alice Neal and her portraits and how yeah. personal they are. And she just had recently had an incredible show at the uh, at the Met. And, so, uh, so okay, done. I want to I want to zoom in on Picasso for a second because I tend okay. I love thinking about how how things change over time and how we change over time. Um, and insofar as you were obsessed enough with Picasso or loved Picasso's work enough when you were a university student to write your thesis on or to do your thesis on his work, I'm curious if your uh, appreciation and interest and affection and sort of love for his work has evolved over time. If you have a very different relationship with his art now than you did, um, you know, you know something, I don't know if I do. Sometimes somebody told me you always love the music you listened to when you were 20. Mm-hmm. And uh, because somehow, I don't know if you stop paying attention to what what's happening in the music world. Yeah. That, but on some level, I evolved to love so much more art. But for me, that because I learned so much about it back then, and I think we often so smart when we're 20 and we take the time to really delve into things. Like when I read what I wrote about it, I'm actually impressed with myself. I don't think I could do that now. So I don't know if it changed. I think it made me, as a, as an artist and a photographer, I think he inspires me by how prolific and how his passion stayed through and how he evolved. Yeah. Even though all of the work is interrelated, there's in, you could see the evolution that happened. Um, Very so. cool. I want to ask okay. you one last question. Okay. Go for it. And then, um, <laughs> This is really kind of off script, but I, I want to ask you about this. Um, as I've already proclaimed, I feel like your, your, your work is, it are sort of variations on self-portraits, essentially, right? Um, and even if you look at the cover of all these different things, like for example, let me pull up one of the covers. Um, Sorry, all the, all the covers are in Lebanon. Yeah. So all the covers are in Lebanon. Thank you. You're helping me make my point. All the covers are in Lebanon and all the covers, the way your name is even written, it's almost like she, i.e. Rania Matas, right? Oh, that <laughs> like, was a designer. So I don't know. <laughs> it is a designer, but I, I feel like um, maybe I'm looking into this too much, but for some reason, I feel like it, um, all of this stuff is very, very much uh, this idea of the self-portrait. So my question is, if you could have a, a pen name, a pseudonym, right? To work on a project that is not up your alley, that your fans and your publishers and your 
agents and your editors and your all the grants would be like, what are you doing? Yeah. If you could create some alter ego just to say, ah, this would be a fun project, but it's not me at all, but it would be super fun. What would that sort of dream uh, phantom project be? I don't know. If I had one, I would do it. Really? Yeah, because actually I was thinking this summer, like, you know, with the Lawen Ruh, I should photograph guys too. But I realized that, you know, those women are spending two hours with me. They are giving themselves completely to the artistic process and they are willing to jump in the water or do things. I don't know how many guys, I just judging by my sons, would give me the time of day to do this. Yeah. But if, But I would love it if I could do that and if they would let me do this with them so I don't know so this is kind of uh maybe make myself do it uh yeah. another but a few projects I did though that were not part of that whole thing and you kind of showed them quickly and I know we don't have time to talk about yeah. them but I tend to also react about things happening in my life that have nothing to do with that whole sequence of work about growing up as a woman and all this. But like during the Thaura in Lebanon, I felt like I needed to photograph that. I have a project where I photographed Syrian refugees on the streets of Beirut um, because as a mother, it was breaking my heart to see those kids. And I started paying attention to all these graffiti walls behind them that were so that became almost like the, the Syrian refugees almost became like the new layer on that wall that witnessed so much history. And then during the during COVID, I started this project going to the windows and photographing people at the windows. And it's so invigorating. So if when things happen, I kind of find a way to turn it into art for me. I think it's to keep me sane, I guess. But um, so that's kind of my answer yeah. to so I highly encourage people to check out your Instagram as well as your uh, your website. It's a beautiful website. There's a ton of stuff on there. Um, the window project we didn't get a chance to talk to uh, talk about today, but it's a really beautiful um, sort of exploration about this moment, this COVID COVID moment. Um, this conversation will go up on our podcast um, and on our YouTube page. Please tell your friends about this. Um, subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube. Send people um, this conversation. Rania, it was so much fun talking to you. You too, Mickey. Thank you so much for that. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.